Today on Mysterion, we have a very special guest, and it's not Gandalf the Grey. <laughs> two friends, two pastors, two theologians, pursuing spiritual life by exploring the scriptures in conversation with the fathers. I'm Dr. Wes Arblaster. And I'm Dr. Ethan Smith. And we are Mysterion. So, as I said today on Mysterion, we have our special guest. It's Archbishop Alexander Galitzin. He is Archbishop of the Bulgarian Diocese in Toledo and of Dallas and of the South of the Orthodox Church in America. <laughs> Welcome to Mysterion. Uh, more importantly, he's a very special guest because um, uh, he's not only the Archbishop, but he's also a very noted scholar of the patristic era of the Church Fathers. And for me, it's very, uh, it's very significant today because his work was really instrumental in my own research and has become so in my own spiritual life as well. Um, despite the fact that he came to me through a questionable source, Father Silvio Bunta, uh, <laughs> yes. he has been a positive influence on me. And so we are really, really excited and happy to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as your own background in studying the Church Fathers, can you just say something about where that, uh, you would say, began for you, if you were to point to a, a starting point? Oh, I should say it probably began for me when I was six or seven. Hmm. That's when in the San Fernando Valley, the Orthodox Church opened up an English language parish for the first time. This was in the early mid-50s. And I had the liturgy, the services in, the, in a language I could follow. And from six or seven, I was hooked. Mm. Um, I think at first it was the sheer aesthetic impress of the Orthodox liturgy, maybe you know the legend of the um, conversion of St. Vladimir's. Mm. Um, according to the story of the Russian primary chronicle, Vladimir decides it's time to get with the program um, and join the international world by adopting one of the three great monotheisms that were available at the time, mm -hmm. Christianity, uh, Judaism, and Islam all of which were neighbors of the fledgling uh, state of Rus, of Kievan Rus. So, again, according to the story, he sends emissaries to the representatives of the main religions, to the Catholics, among the Germans, to the Orthodox at Constantinople, to the Jews at the court of the king of the Khazars in basically what's now the kind of edge of Kazakhstan, I think, and to Islam in Baghdad. And the various agents come back with their reports, and he says, let's hear them. And the first says, well, the Jews have this circumcision thing. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> It's explained to him, and Vladimir says, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then the one to Islam says, well, they can have as many wives as they can support. Oh, says Vladimir, that's, that's very interesting. What next? But they don't allow drink. No, <laughs> says Vladimir. <laughs> next. And the one to the, one to the German says, well, they had these services in a dark in a tall, dark place. It was all stone and very cold, and they muttered a lot. Hmm, says Vladimir. All right. What about you, he says to the ones who had been sent to Constantinople. Oh, they said. They took us to this place, and we know, knew not whether we were on heaven, in heaven or on earth, so great was the beauty there. And we don't know anything about that teach, but surely God is there in that beauty. Hmm. Hmm. And he said, well, that's the one for us. And we can drink, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Right. clears throat> 
Now, that's a legend, of course, um, disguising various motives that were less than aesthetic or religious, but often based on political calculus. Um, but there's a truth in it. And the truth is that enormous aesthetic impact, mm. which certainly I experienced as a child, and which, as I said, hooked me from the start. The fathers came along much, 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 much later. <coughs> when I started, it was the, it was the liturgy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you. Uh, you know, we can get right into some things. I, I appreciate that you told that story and this idea that they, they went to the liturgy, the worship service, and they said, we didn't know if we were in heaven or not. Um, that dovetails nicely with a lot of your research that has affected me, how I read scripture, understand my own spiritual life, uh, in terms of the idea that uh, what the church is doing here is uniting the church within my own heart with the church above. And uh, not simply that that's one idea amongst others, but maybe that's pretty central to what the church is and how scripture presents the revelation of God. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the key to my unraveling of a famously difficult um, patristic writer who was the subject of my doctoral dissertation. This is Dionysius Ariapagitis. I'd actually, that's the name that he took uh, from the disciple of St. Paul mentioned uh, by St. Luke in Acts chapter 19 when St. Paul attempts a rather unsuccessful uh, missionary um, effort at the Areopagus in Athens. He only gets hooks two, I think. Um, one of whom is a certain Dionysius the Areopagite, of whom further we know nothing, until the turn of the 6th century when a set of writings appears under that name. Um, which, in retrospect, of course, for the scholars who started looking at it seriously from the Renaissance, um, couldn't have been written by a first century <laughs> individual. <coughs> and that has led, particularly since the Reformation and Martin Luther, to a great controversy over this figure who was welcomed immediately by the surrounding Christian ambient, first of all, in the Christian East, among the different, even among the different uh, Christologically divided bodies, the Chalcedonian, represented by the Imperial Church in Constantinople, the non-Chalcedonian, the Egyptian and Armenian and Syrian churches, um, and Ethiopian, and then the so-called Nestorians, they weren't, but... Um, of the Far East, meaning Persia uh, and beyond. He was a, an immediate hit, and just as he was an immediate hit in the Latin world when he comes to be translated, first, I think, by John Scotus Eriugana, and then later on by others in the medieval Latin West. Thomas Aquinas quotes him almost as often as he does the Holy Scripture. I believe only Augustine and Aristotle more than yes, yes. than Dionysius. But he's, his bona fides are uh, questioned from the, especially from the Reformation on, and Martin Luther, who didn't think very highly of him, <coughs> to the present. And the basis for that is the very clear impress of late Neoplatonist thought. Uh, in his works, which was documented in the turn of the 20th century by a couple of Germans, always German, uh, <laughs> scholars, but they note down everything <laughs> in, with that wonderful Teutonic thoroughness. Um, they're, you know, they're useful even now, these German scholars sure. from the 19th century, because <laughs> they read everything and noted everything. You can consult them with profit, even if their ideas are cockamamie. Um, but they, they read it all. 
And the argument there was fundamentally, the presupposition there was fundamentally Neoplatonism can't be squared with Christianity, therefore this guy wasn't a really Christian. He was a, a sort of Neoplatonist wolf in Christian sheep's clothing mm, undertaking a massive fraud. Mm -hmm. And that was a guy I had to work with. And the key to unraveling him was exactly this Mm. connection between, as you put it, the three churches, and you're quoting from the Liber Graduum, yes. um, a wonderful Syriac work of the late 4th century, addressed to monks, interestingly, mm. um, that there was a necessary coordination between what the church was doing on earth and what the monk was doing in his cell uh, in prayer and what goes on in heaven. Mm -hmm. And that the church is the necess the church's liturgy is a necessary linkage between those two, mm -hmm. Mm. and that's my Dionysius as well, I think. So uh, it's interesting. So when you did this research on Dionysius, and, and everybody mm -hmm. claimed, and uh, you know, hold up your hand if you're on the panel here and you didn't write a dissertation on Dionysius. So. The odd man out right there, <laughs> um, <laughs> because we b we both did. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> But you argued uh, that Dionysius, uh, that that model on Dionysius, one, it was there, and two, it had, uh, it was from earlier in the tradition. This this idea that oh, it's too Neoplatonist this is an idea of a, a kind of a pagan philosophy. You take Plato's philosophy, and you know through the years, and then and the late version of it. But uh, as we were talking at lunch, it's not simply that these ideas in Dionysius are earlier in the tradition than himself. He's not just cribbing pagan philosophy. But a lot of historical research is now showing this in the scriptures themselves, right? Ah, uh, yes. Whether St. Paul, mm -hmm. really starting with St. Paul, since he's our early, earliest Christian writer, mm -hmm. um, and he has Christians, as, Christians singularly as temple, Christians collectively as temple, and of course, if you inc include Hebrews in his corpus, there's the heavenly temple. Mm -hmm which is uh, foundational to the reading of Hebrews, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a tradition that was in place from at least 200 years before Christ, mm -hmm. which is in turn an explanation of what Moses saw mm -hmm. when God showed him the plan, uh, huh, the word in the pattern, I think is what the English renders in Exodus 25. The Hebrew is tabnit, I don't know the repercussions of that word, but I know the repercussions of the Greek translation that was supplied for it, which is paradigm, mm. Mm. paradigma, which with its echoes of the Platonist, yeah, mm. the course, Platonist yes. realm of the mm -hmm. ideas, and the translators must have had that in partially sure. in mind. Um, <coughs> that this is what Moses saw, what he was shown, and what he was to copy on earth, so that the worship in, on earth be as in heaven on earth as it is in heaven. Somebody important said something like that once before. Yeah. Right? I think on somebody did, yes. I yeah. seem to recall the words, the words of a certain familiarity to them, yes. So, so for those uh, who listen to Mysterian that aren't as familiar with, for example, uh, Dionysius and... Um, Why would they be? Uh, right. <laughs> yes. I think what you're saying, though, does speak to a broader uh, concern um, or issue, which is that oftentimes... Um, people sort of inherit the idea or the picture that the New Testament writers were Jewish and Hebrew, and they therefore, in, in their imagination, in their belief structure, in the way that they practiced um, their faith, they were very much oriented towards the covenant and God's sa saving work in history. And then, Boy, so, so the story goes, right, so the All story right. goes, that later on, then we get more. I'm laying for you, but go on. Yeah, go I, I know. <laughs> but this is the, this, this, the point is, is that you're going to really, I think, challenge this story, which is really important. Is later on, then you get these philosopher Greek uh, things, uh, thinkers like the church fathers, and they turn all that Bible covenant stuff into. Plato. Oh, Plato and philosophy, uh, and we move away the from ideas. the God of Scripture, and we move toward the God of the philosophers. And I think you've been a really important voice to challenge that whole picture 
about the supposed uh, Platonization or the the, uh, the 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 transformation of the biblical view to the Greek philosophical view, right? Of course, that's I mean that's been in place since at least the late 19th century, the, the theory of the Hellenization of the gospel, that was, for example, Adolf von Harnack. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's wrong in uh, ways almost too many to enumerate. First of all, of course, it, uh, it's an entirely anachronistic view of the Judaism of the first century. Um, I think it's a misreading of the rabbis themselves at present, in the present day. Mm. But the further mistake is to assume that the Judaism, the rabbinic Judaism of the present day, is identical to what was what was in what was present in the first century, which is simply false. Mm-hmm. A number of very accomplished Jewish scholars have been demonstrating that for some time now, mm-hmm. including one I I knew. I wish I could call him a friend. I didn't know him that well, but Alan Siegel was one. Um, mm-hmm who very clearly uh, demonstrates in his work that Christianity and Judaism, as we know it today, are both of them products of the first century. Mm. Um, that we're siblings. It's not mother-daughter, but it's, it's sisters, mm. as it were, mm. sister religions, um, related. And the fault in assuming a perfect... Um, not continuity, because there's obviously continuity, but a perfect identity between the Judaism of the first century and and contemporary rabbinic Judaism obscures some things that were quite basic. What was the piety of your Galilean peasant? Well, we see it in in the Lord Jesus, Joseph, and Mary Mm. in uh, chapter 2 of Luke. What are they doing? They're making a pilgrimage. Mm. They're going to the temple one of the great feasts where they where he loses them for a few days right mm-hmm. to go sit in the among the temple teachers but that's the center of their piety mm-hmm. the, the temple temple I mean, they would have had to walk a week to get from nazareth to jerusalem and then back and probably on the way they were singing the songs of ascent mm-hmm. Uh, that we find from Psalm 120 to 132, is it, I think, um, that we still sing in Lent, by the way. Um, That would have been the center of their piety. Ditto for then the, the people that he picks as his disciples, the, the fishermen and the tax collector and the the other odd bods uh, who form his motley, and it was a motley team, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're taken from the peasantry for the most part. Maybe John is an exception. There's some suggestion. He knows the family of the high priest. Maybe he was coming from a quality family. You don't know. Um, these would have been people whose piety was the same. We know from at least 200 B.C., but the identity between what Moses was shown that had as the tabernacle, the pan for the tabernacle, and the heaven and the heavenly model, that the idea of the liturgy in the temple as in, as as the as the uh, faithful replication of the liturgy in heaven, and I'm not talking about the blood sacrifice because that's mm-hmm. something that's obviously peculiar and that they knew was related to humans and sin. And, and blood only entered the temple on that one day of the year mm-hmm. at the high priest that's the center of the epistle to the Hebrews. <coughs> so temple is a fundamental feature of the piety of the first century Jew. How could it not have been mm-hmm. a fundamental feature of the first Christians? Yeah. And, if I could and we find them in the temple, mm-hmm. according to Luke, uh, yes. at the end of the gospel, after the resurrection, yes, and at the yes. beginning of Acts. And thereafter, a number of chapters. You paint that picture of their piety. They're, they're going on a pilgrimage to the mm-hmm. temple. And I just want to make the connection for our listeners, because you, you made a really profound point. What they thought they were going to was the earthly representation of what's always going on in and heaven. The, and, the, and the divine presence, as divine one presence. Jewish scholar put it. 
for uh, Jews, God has an address. It's number one Temple Street. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And so, and one of the things I think too, the word that I think you just said is an important word. Their 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 life of faith, their life of piety, was oriented toward the presence of God. Yes. Um, and again, the story that we tend to inherit is the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, are about covenant. They're about rules and obeying rules, and that's really what was going on back then. Um, and what you are saying is actually, in fact, what the life of uh, uh, the first century Judaism um, was centered on God's presence and proximity to God, um, approaching God on that, in that ascent, right? Um, and so the center of it, the center of uh, their, their life of piety, their life of faith, is, um, is the presence of God within, hidden within um, the temple. The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies. Revelation. And, and the Christian and the Christians, um, as, as they began to uh, uh, live out their life of faith in relationship to um, Christ, um, and as they wrote their scriptures, that, that was not something that, that was central to them as well. They began to understand Christ in light of temple, um, in light of presence, um, not so much, not centrally just Christ and covenant, we would say. No. I mean, Christ is the presence. Mm -hmm. And he was the presence mm -hmm. in the temple. Mm -hmm. That's why they're in the temple. Because mm -hmm. the one behind the holy, of the, 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 the veil of the temple is him, is mm -hmm. he. Mm -hmm. The same one. Yeah, so it's interesting if you look at, say, the life of James, um, mm -hmm. and all the traditions are that he was in the temple all the time, all the time, all the time. And wore the regalia of a high priest. Exactly. And if, why is he in the temple then? Because he believes the resurrected Christ is there, enthroned there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So how then do we see, how would you suggest that, that the fathers teach us to read Scripture how do, they, how do they open our eyes to these kinds of um, truths? Um, because I, I'll have to say, growing up, as I read my Bible uh, and within my, my own lens, my own sort of evangelical Protestant lens, I, I didn't see it. And I, and I needed, in some sense, the help of the fathers and, um, and also some, um, some scholarly work from people like you to be able to say, wait a minute, that's all over the place. I just didn't see it before. Um, so how is it the fathers, um, how is it that the fathers open our eyes to see these kinds of things in the scriptures? Well, I quoted two things to you uh, at lunch today mm -hmm. before we came, and I'll repeat them for uh, our listeners. The first is an image used by St. Irenaeus of Lyon in the uh, late second century, who wrote, by the way, what turned out to be a bestseller, <laughs> because we have copies of it uh, within 20 years in Egypt, um, <coughs> called uh, Against the False Knowledge. He was writing against the Gnostics for his congregation in uh, Lugdunum, modern Lyon. And in the first uh, book of his first book, the first chapter of his first book, he has a wonderful image. He says, these people, they're like, meaning they're not his opponents, they're like people who take a part in a mosaic image of the emperor. Because, you know, kind of like our federal buildings, there's always a picture of the current mm -hmm. president. Well, in any major building, official building in the Roman world, there would be a statue or an image of the reigning emperor to which you would offer incense from time to time because he is a personification of the divinity of the state. <coughs> and people who take apart the mosaic into its individual tesserae, the little bits that make up a mosaic, and then re reassemble the tesserae, the same tesserae, meaning the scriptural verses in effect, to make a wholly different image, uh, a picture of a fox, he says, or a fish. And I tell you, that's the, that's the image of the emperor. 
how do you know it's not the image? How, how do you discern the image, the proper image of the king, which is in all the scriptures, the king meaning Christ? He says, by the confession you make at baptism later on. And what's that? Well, we know from uh, roughly contemporary texts like Hippolytus uh, Apostolic, um, what was it? Apostolic tradition. Uh, that that's the those are the questions that the bishop asked the person being uh, baptized at the time of his or her baptism. Do you believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth? Do you believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, begotten of the Father, etc.? Do you believe in one Holy Spirit, the Church, the resurrection of the dead? In, in essence, the creed is uh, what would what would become uh, the Apostles or Nicene Creed. Uh, you have to have that to see the image, mm -hmm. to discern the image which is Christ. That the, that the faith in the Trinity, which is only comes to the revelation of the Lord Jesus, the faith in the Trinity is the proper lens for scriptural interpretation. And this is also the point made uh, not quite 200 years later by Basil of Caesarea in his treatise in defense of the Holy Spirit that the confession of the Holy Trinity is the key to understanding Scripture. So there's that. Well, that's a liturgical act, yes? Mm. That's something that's done in the context of the, of the common worship of the community at the baptism of a, uh, of a catechumen for which they would all have been present, probably at the Easter vigil. Okay, that's one. Uh, then the second quotation I, I, uh, I cited at lunch was from Origin of Alexandria, the great, um, very great um, patristic writer. He was not appreciated um, 300 years later. They condemned him as a heretic after he had died in the peace of the church 300 years, um, which was wrong. Uh, but he was still a saint. Um, he quotes this saying. He says, my Hebrew teacher used to say, was certainly a Jew, uh, every scripture verse is a locked door, and at the base of every such door there is a key. But that particular key does not fit that particular lock. So you have to know all the keys and all the locks. You have to know the whole scripture to understand any of it. Mm -hmm. And the presupposition here is that scripture is one thing, mm -hmm. that it is one reality. And in origin, it becomes clear that reality is the, is the presence of Christ. That reality is Christ. So it is Christ that unlocks all yes, of the keys, all, all the doors. All of the doors. Right. Yeah. All the doors and who is present in all the words. Scripture, in other words, to put it in our language, the Orthodox language, Scripture is a sacrament. Mm -hmm. Mm. It is a physical thing. These are words, a printed page. But it's not the words, it's not the printed page, it's not the book. It's the presence in them. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we could draw some of this conversation we've had uh, together since mm -hmm. we've been talking, you know, if we've got temple or church above mm -hmm. and below and in the heart, and then scripture, and there's all these doors and all these locks, but it all opens up to the one mystery, who is Which Christ. Is Christ. <laughs> the directive for us who are trying to live Christian lives today is we go through all of scripture looking for the one who is on the throne above mm -hmm. and the altar of the church, but also within in the our heart. hearts. So this, the book exists to, not simply to reveal heavenly facts, but to actually reveal Christ himself. In that, us. In us. Mm -hmm. Every page, every word, in fact, right? Yes. So, um, uh, to me, that w when I started reading your stuff, I began picking up on this. Um, that's tremendously uh, liberating, as far as you know. If you get educated into scripture at, say, seminary today, it can become kind of like dead stuff. It's just history, or it's stuff oh, to I argue well, over. Because we had to read the same bloody stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. or it's just stuff to argue same over. Same Germans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stuff to help you get obsessed with other people's sins, or yeah. this, that, or the other thing. But if scripture itself is actually um, a roadmap or a grammar 
a grammar to learn the language of heaven where Christ is revealed on the throne or within your own heart. That's quite different. Well, yes, a grammar to learn about, again, Christ. Mm. It's all Christ. It's always all Christ. So, and one of the things that um, you also um, have spent um, a fair amount of time doing scholarly work on is on the, the traditions uh, in, the early, uh, in the early church, uh, the, what we call the ascetical, mystical traditions. Mm-hmm. You know, um, again, for our audience, ascetical means uh, training. Like we, in season two, when we were talking about Evagrius and mm-hmm. that kind of training that um, uh, one's life uh, uh, is formed by that kind of spiritual training. And the mystical, we're talking about ex- experience, right? Yes, the encounter. The encounter. And so for, for, for you, again... Um, the fathers help us read scripture. Um, would you point towards those kinds of things? Not because oftentimes when we read the fathers, for example, we're exposed to fathers. It tends to be more of uh, doctrinal teachings or dogma. But um, what um, what you have spent a fair amount of time investigating is the way in which spiritual practice, spiritual discipline, asceticism, and also the seeking after an encounter. Um, with that presence, um, is at the center of is at the center of what they when they approach scripture. That's that's they're they're looking to shape to be shaped in such a way that they encounter Christ there. Am, am, am I right? Am I right in that? Or uh, I think that's pretty good. I guess, but you spent I mean you've spent time looking at, for example, those those traditions that really focus on that aspect of life, uh, spiritual life, as being essential to what they're about, not just getting the doctrines right or the teachings right. No, it's never about that. And the doctrines, as they would say, well, let me quote a rabbinic saying about um, um, what they're doing in Mishnah and Talmud. They are setting a fence around the Torah. Yes? Mm. Well, I think we could say that all the, the doctrines are setting a fence around the mystery. Hmm. Um, they're not allowing you to, to play with it hmm. in any way you please. Hmm. But what is essential isn't the words or the, the doctrine. What's essential is the reality the doctrines point towards. Because any doctrine is, uh, is inadequate as a human formulation to the reality toward which it points. Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, I saw it in a lot of my, la- the last work that I was doing when I was still an academic, um, in, in tracing this continuum of expectation, if you will, from the pre-Christian era of the late Second Temple, in particular in apocalyptic literature, because, it's, again, it's a kind of not a universal revolution in reading apocalyptic literature, but it's now possible in a way it wouldn't have been, say, a couple of generations ago, to see them as testimonies of experience, mm. not simply as literary products. So we're talking about a book like Revelation. I'm just talking about a book like yeah. Revelation yeah. or Daniel. Daniel. Or First Enoch. Mm-hmm. Or the, or the other Enochic books, and that whole raft of apocalypses that didn't mm-hmm. find their way into anybody's canon, mm-hmm. except maybe the Ethiopian, well, in the case of <laughs> First Enoch, um, but that are in that wonderful collection that Professor Charles Wood put together mm-hmm. uh, in North Carolina uh, called uh, Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. Now, what's interesting about those two volumes, and there are two volumes, a thousand pages each, uh, fine print, double columned, more mass than is in the Bible, yes? All that, almost all that stuff is originally Jewish composition. Some of it's Christian, but most of it's Jewish. But preserved entirely by Christian sources. Uh, mostly monks, probably from the fourth or fifth century on, but it would have been, uh, you know, it would have been in, they're in monasteries and in, in Mount Athos in the medieval period, just like the New Testament apocrypha, mm-hmm. uh, the apocryphal Acts, which uh, deserve uh, attention. Mm. 
they have a few weird ideas, but um, they're also testimonies to these currents. Even the Gnostic stuff, at its most Looney Tunes, um, it's still testifying to some of these some of these elements which are, which are being taken and reworked into this peculiar uh, dualistic system that the Gnostics had. And as much as we can talk as that about that as a single thing, which mm -hmm. is a matter of scholarly debate now. Um, so, in uh, in the apocalyptic literature, you have a clear ascesis. There's, you know, the, 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 the seer is usually engaged in some ascetical exercises. At the time of, of Daniel, for example, does a vegetarian, mm -hmm. no wine, just water and a lot. John, it's on the Lord's Day, so it's a mm. Eucharistic day. Mm. <clears throat> Who was that article on Jewish mystic, Jewish asceticism? That was a damn good article. In the collection on mysticism in the in Jewish Jewish tradition. Mm. I can't remember his name. Mm. Teaches, I think, in some East Coast university. But he points this out that this is a very consistent feature. And these are features that you see then repeated in the Christian materials. And it's an expectation, or in hope at least, of an experience, of an encounter, of a theophany, yes? which is indeed in the apocalypse is what often occurs. Mm -hmm. well, otherwise, the book wouldn't be written. Right? Um, and a feature of these, ap these appearances of God are often a trip to heaven, as in, again, John. Mm -hmm. He's taken up. Daniel has the dream. Uh, Enoch is taken up, and that's pre-Daniel. And it was a British scholar, um, Christopher Rowland, I think, who in what was about 40 years ago, um, in the open heaven, said, and these are testimonies, among other things, to the belief that there are people who have actually gone up and come back down mm -hmm. with something to say. So, that carries on into the Christian tradition in, in a, I think, an unbroken ascetic uh, current from the first century uh, into the, when we first find historical monasticism in, the, uh, in Egypt and uh, in Syria and Mesopotamia. And clearly there, in those cases, it's been around for a while, even when a even Antony mentions communities of virgins in his village and uh, various ascetics on the outskirts of the village that he goes to consult with. So he's not the first by any means. Mm -hmm. And Afrahat mentions his Ihidae, who are clearly an established institution in by the mid fourth century. So been around so long they've gone bad in some ways that mm -hmm. he's in ways he's trying to correct. So this is a current that is there and I'm interested being Orthodox, what sets us Orthodox off is continuity. Mm. <laughs> you know, some people get excited about originality, uh, innovation, exciting new thought. You say continuity and our blood starts to race. <laughs> yes. um, and a continuity between, say, St. Paul, as you were mentioning to me uh, uh, regarding Alan Siegel's work just after lunch, St. Paul and Gregory Palamas, the great uh, defender of the Hesychist monks in the 14th century Byzantium. <coughs> well, there's a continuity. There's a, a similarity. Well, not, I would not similarity, I think an identity. Mm -hmm. So that's a doctrinal point, and that's a dogmatic point. That's not something that can be proven in a way. Mm -hmm. What can be shown, at least, is our very striking Mm -hmm. similarities. Mm -hmm. I don't see those as accidental, but rather as part of the stuff, the warp and the woof mm. of the Christian experience over the millennia. So it sounds, it sounds, um, would it be right to say in some sense that your, your scholarship is trying to point to historically to show that um, the great teachers, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and even uh, those um, surrounding the, um, those individuals surrounding the production of scriptures, the centerpiece of their spiritual life is not so much the head in the sense of what they think about God, but what is, but it's the heart. Um, and you and can see that of the Platonists too, by the mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Because Plato's not about, first of all, he's not about sequential thought, first and foremost. That's not going to lead you to the, to the intuition of the forms. Mm-hmm. That comes of itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, the Christian writers who knew the Greek, stu- Greek, Greek materials took over a very important word, the word nous, which we usually translate as mind or intellect. But in modern English, mind or intellect are kind of weak. Uh, they're usually simply identified with consciousness, um, self-awareness, thought. But for uh, the Platonists, it's the noose is that point in us which connects with the eternal. Hmm. For Plato, the realm of the forms. For someone like Plotinus, the one. Hmm. Um, and they, they take that word happily. They'll, use, they'll also use the biblical word heart for much the same purpose. Mm-hmm. That, that's, the, that's your center. That's the point where, as it were, the, a potential meeting between you and God and the uncreated. Mm-hmm. Christ for us. Um, So it's part of the, uh, if you will, the, the, the Christian ad- um, adaptation of the, uh, of the Hellenistic inheritance. Uh, another point relevant, relative specifically to Dionysius concerning the late Neoplatonists is that they said you know, the mind, the, the intellect, the news couldn't get to God all by itself. For Plotinus, we're like a strike, a rubber band, right? Hmm. Part of us is always up there. And then there's a part of us that's down here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the point of uh, philosophical life is to let go of the other end so the band snaps back up. Mm. Um, unity, which uh, event that, that only occurs briefly because then somehow the band stretches it back again. Mm. But the, someone like Proclus, whom Dionysius read, no, you can't do that by yourself. Mm. What you need are the rights that are handed down from time immemorial that, that effect a union between you and the supernal realms that can't be accomplished. By mm. hmm. And part of Dionysius' argument is that, well, you got the wrong rights. We've got them. We have the ones that are revealed to Moses and Sinai and to, the, uh, to Solomon at the temple and to and to the apostles and Christ came. This is the, this is the true connection between us and the supernal realm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a, really, that's a kind of footnote. Mm-hmm. Um, so what was your question again? <laughs> oh, we were just asking about the, the centrality of the heart, and I think it might yes. bring well, up... I can't bring this up. Just if I want to tie some of these conversations together. Oh, yes. so you were talking about apocalyptic literature. Yes, we can point out right that the language of apocalypse means unveiling. So we're we're in temple There's a language. Story. One of my yeah. former students, it's a, a priest now married. Um, I hope Rebecca hears this. When he was courting his wife to be, she was a, a she was a believing Christian. Uh, Protestant background and a biblical scholar. She's become a very distinguished biblical scholar now. And he said, how do I start? I'll take her to a church. So he takes her to a church and she walks in to an Orthodox church for the first time and she looks around and then she says, oh, apocalypse. Mm. And she was just exactly right. Mm, mm. Just exactly right. Mm-hmm. She got it in one. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what it is. It's mm-hmm. here. It is. Here's the here's the kingdom come. Mm-hmm. Unveiled. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. It means an unveiling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's it's temple language, right? It is temple language. So it's interesting. I, I picked this up from your research too. The way, say, Paul uses that 
unveiling language, that apocalypse language, relative to the heart inside. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're gonna, I'm going to drive it back to the three churches every time. That's just what I do. But uh, well, talk about the, the exper apocalypse as experience. It's not just prediction of future, oh, but no, it's an no, unveiling no. of the mystery. And the mystery is above. You have people going above or going into the heart of the temple or deep into the heart into themselves. of themselves. Right. So this is why Paul can talk about in the body or out of the body. I don't know. No. I don't know. Oh. Does it make a difference? Both no. open up into the same throne room where yes, the same the throne. glory is unveiled. Apocalypse. The and same throne and the same glory. Yes, and so I mean, so this idea of apocalypse as experiential doesn't just mean something out there, but it can be something very much within, right? Yes, and it's yeah. from the and something within. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned the three churches. This is a church on earth. Church on earth, which is a revelation of this apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of a work by a Protestant scholar, uh, Pierre Prigent, um, late 60s, called Apocalypse Liturgy, mm. which is um, a discussion of the book of Revelation as a Paschal liturgy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether how, how much uh, sway that holds, but certainly the perception that there's liturgy going on mm -hmm. here is, seems to me pretty bloody obvious. Mm -hmm. You've even got antiphonal choirs, for goodness sake. I think one of the things... I my undergraduates have, you know, <laughs> one sing, one chorus, one, one read, one chorus, they all read, one chorus, and they all come together for the amen. Or mm -hmm. I think one thing that um, you, you said, um, I think you mentioned earlier, that the liturgy provides that helps you see some of these things, and I think it's some, something that I think is a little bit less familiar with um, mm -hmm. non, non liturgical traditions, which is that there is a sense in which... Um, in your in your um, celebration of um, the liturgy, that there is something that's eternally, um, your your everything's happening around an eternal center, which is um, God, and we uh, enter in through the liturgy. You enter into that um, eternal reality. Uh, you participate in some sense in this. Um, endless um, uh, worship or endless liturgy happening around the eternal throne. Um, and um, I think one of the things that we tend to, um, I, that seems to me to help in understanding the temple um, as being central to um, scripture and our spiritual life, because there's a sense in which all of our life is orbiting around the throne of God. Everything, the whole universe, or it orbits around, in some sense, centered upon the eternal throne of God. Um, and uh, one thing that um, I think when, when that is lost, what we tend to do is we tend to look at the Bible more as like a storybook. Like it has a beginning and a middle and an end, and it's telling the story. And you almost lose that sense of that eternal center, whether the center is the eternal throne, the altar, or in the heart. When that, then that's lost, it tends to, we tend to begin to look at it just like a, like I said, like a big storybook. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yes, although I'm glad I've never had that sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, I would say, am I right in saying we kind of I mean, grew up thinking that we're part of a, a story and it's constantly we're changing? We're in a later chapter of the same story that's in the Bible, but the idea that that, There's that a same life that yeah. has that center in Christ revealed... Mm, not so much. It's more of a sequential story. Um. Well, I don't. I've, I've run across the idea, and I've been told. I, well, I mean, Christ has come, so we don't need temple. Mm -hmm. It's all over. It's a fapax. All that's out. Well, that's not what Hebrews says. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the the Yom Kippur, the the rite of atonement. That's over. That's done. Uh, that's what he does. Mm -hmm. He's the high priest, accomplishes a fapax once and for all, what the high priests were obliged to repeat yearly. But all the rest, it's a divine revelation. Mm -hmm. As I point out uh, to oh, my clergy, my uh, faithful, you know, um, When you first, you first set out to read the Bible cover to cover, as I did when I was a first or second year undergraduate, well, I'm just going to read the Bible. 
Remember, it goes great for the, you know, it goes great through Exodus, that, or through, through uh, Genesis, that's fine, all kinds of stories, adventures. Then you get to Exodus, so that's pretty good too. Plagues, Pharaoh, Red Sea, wandering in the desert. And then you hit, and then the appearance in Sinai, and then you hit this wall. Pages and pages and pages of cubits and kinds of wood and types of yarn and mm -hmm. ugh. And I said, you know, that's our attitude. And we'll maybe we give up our first attempt there, and then finally we soldier through it at some point, and together with Deuteronomy and with, with uh, Leviticus and Numbers, which aren't a lot better. Um, <laughs> especially Leviticus. Uh, <clears throat> but I said, if you look at the ancient church fathers, like Gregory Nyssa's Life of Moses, or the ancient rabbis, they can't get enough of those chapters. The same ones that, you, that we say, oh, God. And why can't they get enough? Because this is the revelation. This is the revelation of how to worship. Mm that's divinely given. Um, it's on earth as in heaven. Yes. Yes, and Gregory spends half his life of Moses on those chapters. And it's not, an, it's not a small book. Mm. Mm. Well, to wrap it up, uh, yeah, I think one of the things one of the things that we would love to um, hear from our audience just over the next uh, week or week and a half, if you guys could begin to share some questions that you might have about, I think the three this this theme of the three temples is something that just keeps coming back mm -hmm. again and again and again um, in so in our passage. discussion. Mm -hmm. And I uh, would love to hear what you guys have to think about that, because it seems to me like what we're saying is, is what is shared in common, the Jewish tradition, first century um, uh, Christians, and then onward is the sense of proximity to Christ and that proximity, that approaching the presence of Christ is uh, approaching the divine throne, which is the drawing together of those, of those three. Am I, uh, yes, and and as you like to say about Maximus. The drawing together of the cosmos, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Of yeah. the universe. Yeah. The bridging of the various divisions mm -hmm. in the world, male, female, human, angel, created, uncreated. Mm -hmm. All, of course, of which is accomplished already and completely in Christ. Mm -hmm. And our lives in Christ then become then becomes, then become, become becoming what we already are mm -hmm. in Christ. Mm -hmm. Hell will be when we find we don't conform to what we are. <laughs> right. What we already are in heaven will be our conformity to that. Or as the Gospel of Thomas puts it, when you make the inside like the outside, then you enter into the kingdom. The eschatological outside and it has to be matched by the eschatological inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it Bishop is an Alexander. honor. It's privilege. been yes. quite an honor. Yes. Uh, massive influence over my work, uh, whether scholarly or pastoral. And so we I really appreciate having you here. Humbled by that, uh, by that tribute. And thank you very much for both of you for this occasion. Thank you. I want to encourage my clergy to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right thanks thank for you. joining us. See you next week. Bye.